your heart and mind. Oh, this one here? I have an announcement about the audio tapes. Any orders turned in by 11 this morning will be processed. Gentlemen, this morning we'd like to present for you Tom Brown and Eric Dollar. Their subject this morning is new researches on the multi-wave oscillator. Thank you. Um, there's been a lot of interest lately in the multi-wave oscillator. My first interest in it came through reading a book that Borderland Sciences Research published which was uh, some information that Dr. Bob Beck released in the early 60s. And I was absolutely fascinated by the possibilities of this. And basically what the multi-wave oscillator is from the standpoint, as I understood then, was you take a concentric ring antenna similar to the one that you see here, and uh, you drive it with a Tesla coil to spark the you drive a spark down here and each ring will then oscillate by being driven by the spark. And apparently in the researchers there have been some very good results um, as far as beneficial effects on life waves. And the theory behind this is that um, everything resonates. You take a section of wire and it's going to resonate because of the, uh, you can call it cosmic radiation or orgone or ether or whatever you want which is always flowing in the universe and it drives it and oscillates it to a certain degree. And uh, when you put it into a coil form, then you get a closed oscillatory system. And uh, the center of every cell is the RNA-DNA molecule, which is a spiral helix. And this also has a resonant frequency. And it's been found that these resonant frequencies are within the radio range. So by shock driving these antennas, you could produce all the oscillations of the body and uh, therefore bring into balance. And I would like to point out this time that we're not recommending this for any medical use whatsoever. We're just researching into the waveforms and maybe in agriculture and stuff. Don't, please don't come to us for any uh, use. We won't sell these for medical use, just purely for research is uh, our whole idea of doing this. And uh, because some very beneficial results have been developed. This was developed by Dr. Georges Lakovsky, and it was outlined in his book, The Secret of Life, which is available from us or from Health Research, publishes it, or several other sources. I think Phoenix Books might have it too. And uh, also in, in that book, he talked about the theory of um, how the, there was all these vibrations and interactions carried us all through life, and how areas where there was real thick clays in the ground, people had more cancer because the radiations were bouncing back up into the bodies. And, driving the oscillatory equilibrium out of uh, balance. And uh, Lukowski also found that his antennas worked without power in the way that he would take a single strip of wire about eight inches long and curve it into a loop with the ends overlapping but not touching and he would put them around the base of a plant that had been injected with a cancer or something. And the cancer on the plant would dry up and fall off and the plant would grow We've done some preliminary experiments with this to test it out because we like to test everything that we read and see if it really does work because we've read an awful lot of stuff and I'm not sure if everything's true, can't all be. And, uh, but we have on some plants, we've uh, put the rings around and watched them perk up over like a day's period. So we're gonna start doing controlled experiments on this and we'll re release the results in the Journal of Borderland Research. And uh, this ties in with some other work of uh, people who working along his lines. Nikola Tesla put on an article on electrotherapeutics and he found that there was b very beneficial effects being around these high frequency coils. Um, I've talked to uh, Peter Lindemann who's been around a lot of different coils and uh, he says some of them put off real bad radiations and some put off real good. He's very sensitive. I'm not as sensitive. I can't really feel it. Um, but that is one I've heard of. And apparently it works somewhere along the same way. We're not sure exactly what radiation, Lukowski said Hertzian radiations, but this might have just been a general term he was using because he didn't really get too technical as far as his writings went. Nobody knows exactly what he did. And also a man named Royal Raymond Reif, if anyone has ever heard of him, he developed an optical microscope that could see the living virus in vitro, where an electron microscope kills a virus and puffs it up so they can't experience it. Reif had an optical microscope that could see this and he would isolate viruses out of cancer and he would uh, then 
tune a frequency instrument, a frequency beam, which was basically a, a Tesla coil driven by a shortwave, uh, uh, what do you call it, a shortwave uh, broadcaster. And instead of the extra coil, or the Tesla coil, he had a resonant uh, gas tube on there which would project a beam and he could tune the frequencies and he found the frequencies of the viruses and published all his works and uh, found it, he, what he called the mortal oscillatory rate, which is like when a singer hits the rate of a glass and shatters a glass. It's exactly what he was doing with the viruses and he could see it in his microscopes. And uh, we, we're trying to bring some of his work back on the open. It's been long covered up and lost. And it ties in directly with what Tesla and Lukowski were doing. And basically what they were trying to do is uh, you know, regenerate the life force in some way. And of course, that's what everybody's trying to do. You know, I think that's what uh, a lot of us are all here for, is to find out you know, how these things really work, you know, their interaction. I find it amazing that so many people are here looking into health and eat the food they put in the cafeteria, but I guess we got to do the best we can. But one person who worked with uh, passive devices who produced the same results was a man named Wilhelm Reich. And basically he was slowing down the time flow because if you take an electroscope and it discharges down, if you're familiar with the electroscope, it has two leaves that push apart when you put a static charge on it and they slowly discharge. You bring an electroscope into an argon accumulator and stops discharging. You just like a cell discharges its energy. And that's basically what the effect we're trying to produce with our antennas here. So in, um, quite a few people have built these devices as Borderland published. I've heard some amazing results on them. And uh, you know the stuff is always there for research. We thought we'd just look in because in Lukowski's pictures in the ways that heal, he's got two wires going to the antenna. And in this design, he had one wire going to the antenna. And I wasn't really too sure on this. And now Ed Skilling told me, he says, well, take the antenna off and throw it away. He says, you don't need the antenna. That was one opinion. And uh, I started talking with Eric about this and uh, find out what was going on with it. And Eric, uh, finger doused the picture in the waves that heal and found out what was inside the canister holding up the antennas. And with his knowledge of waveforms and his knowledge of uh, other high frequency apparatus, we feel we've come up with what Lukowski actually had in his picture. Now we haven't run any experiments on this stuff and we don't know any results. We're just guessing, we're just researching. There's just preliminary research that we're releasing here for anybody that wants to carry this stuff on. So this isn't gospel, this is just science here. <laughs> but we found here that these things actually produce, in development of this antenna, we found that we may not even need power because like Lukowski, he, he gave profound results with just single strips of wire. And preliminary experiments with Lukowski antennas, we found that we can double the growth rates of sprouts. That's just a you know, objective observation of myself. We haven't recorded this scientifically yet, so you'll have to try it yourself if you want to believe it. But we will be doing controlled experiments and releasing the results as far as pictures and everything else is what we're interested in to see how stuff really works. But maybe I could let Eric explain a little bit of the technical side of these, the two systems. Uh, one in honor of Dr. Beck, we'll call the Beck system. And uh, the other one we'll call the Lukowski system. And uh, let Eric take over from there. And uh, this is an open forum. We'd like to get Dr. Beck up here to give his uh, position on it because he's done a lot more work in this than we have. We're just guessing. He no, really knows what's going on. And at least we hope he does. He <laughs> looks pretty good up there. I reserve the right to change my life tomorrow. <laughs> That's pure science, Bob. Keep an open mind. <laughs> So can you explain this, Eric? So anybody's welcome to put in their input or ask questions. You know, we just want to, this is an open forum here, not a formal talk. Okay, in the system in present usage, what we have here is, is two plates with concentric rings, such as you see in this situation here, even though the geometry is a little different. And these all add up to form what's a capacitor plate. Basically, you have a surface here, and if you apply an electric charge to any point on this, the whole thing builds up a static field around it, 
And often you'll get sparks jumping between the plates as the thing tries to equalize its potential out and become to one static electric potential. So this is hooked to a Tesla transformer, which is often grounded to one side. And what you have here is you have a space in between these two antennas that becomes altered by the high voltage, high frequency output of the Tesla transformer. So what this reduces to is basically as you have two plates of a capacitor driven by a high frequency or impulse current generator, which produces a current in this space. The intensity of this current is directly proportional to the amount of lines of electric force that are produced by this coil, which is often called the voltage. And the time rate at which this is charged and discharged by the sudden reversals of electric potential produced by the coil. So inside this, you basically have a modified space here consisting of a kind of ether shock waves. Now I found that if you take and put a spark gap across this, that this space then discharges in, in nanoseconds and you produce a, um, a kind of explosive action in this space. In other words, you have electric lines of induction which form a type of compression inside this space which is often wrongly called a scalar field. In actuality, what it is, it's a, a static longitudinal field. So you can kind of view it like as a, a tank or cylinder filled with compressed gas. And when you put a spark gap across this, then this pressure is suddenly relieved and all of this force explodes outwards faster than the velocity of light against the bounding structures. We've had people, you know, indicate they felt rather profound experiences inside this space. And it'll be interesting to experiment to see exactly what kind of effect this has and as far as with relation to, you know, mind states and diseases and what have you. Okay, what Lukoski was actually doing, however, was he was, rather than feeding this thing straight in with a field of electrical flux supplied along a conductor from a Tesla transformer, he was feeding the thing like this and supplying electric current around the loop, which is exactly 90 degrees from the other system. Okay, basically what you have here is you take your capacitor, which you normally discharge into the Tesla coil, and discharge it straight into this loop and it produces what's called an oscillating circuit. And basically, if you take the um, coefficient or the degree at which this loop can store magnetic energy through the lines of force that surround it, and the degree of which the capacitor can store dielectric energy by the lines of force that stand between it, then that gives you the basic period of oscillation, which produces the familiar electric waveform we call a sine wave. Now, of course, you know, losses and radiation eat this up, so in actuality you get a wave that dampens out and disappears, which is called an electric oscillation. Okay, what Lukowski did was put a resonance structure inside of this loop to be excited by the electromagnetic field and longitudinal field and scalar fields produced by this loop, each one of these having its own little capacitor and serving as an oscillating circuit. Now the theory was here is each one of these oscillators would oscillate at a different frequency, and if you had enough of these loops, you would produce all the frequencies required to resonate to the individual oscillating circuits inside the body. So you start off with a long wavelength or a low frequency and work your way up, so you produce what's called a harmonic spectrum. So if you looked at this on a graph where you had, let's say, you know, rate or frequency, rate of oscillation going this way and intensity going this way, it produces a series of oscillations which keep on going on and on forever. But of course the amplitude drops by some function similar to an exponential function with respect to distance. And also the fact that you have kind of a raucous random pattern in the spark gap here, these things broaden out to produce kind of an envelope, electrical energy. So if you have, let's say, a plot of the cells in your body and they resonate at these various frequencies, then if you feed them a spectrum of energy, then each one will pick its own characteristic frequency out of that spectrum of energy and oscillate 
and Wachowski felt this oscillation would power the cell back up and bring it back to life. Okay, now, with the ratios of patterns involved here, normally you have, I wish we have a regular log periodic antenna, one that's not logarithmic. No. Okay, what we've done here is there's a specific ratio involved in life called the golden ratio. Now, as an example of this, if I take the length from my shoulder to my arm and compare that from the length of my shoulder to my wrist, and then the length from that to the beginning of my fingers, and then the length to the first knuckle, and the length to the second knuckle, and the length so on down the line right to the tip, then we end up with a series which is similar to the harmonic pattern of the first coil I showed you, where each one of these is basically 60% of the one that preceded it. It's what's called the golden ratio. Now you find this pattern like in leaves and, and plants, where if you have a leaf, the vein structure always goes along with this ratio, and it produces a specific geometric angle Thirty-six degrees, and then there's another angle involved here of 108 degrees, and all these basically come up to be what's called the golden ratio, which you take a circle, divide it into five parts, and that gives you your various angles, and you have to split them to get the 36 degrees. But each one of these is twice 36 or 72 degrees. So what we've done is taken these, these patterns and applied them to in what's called log periodic antenna theory. Now your regular television antenna that you used to have years ago was built like a, kind of like a leaf of a plant. It had a guiding structure. And then you had elements come off of this, which are usually in kind of a crazy distorted pattern. It appeared to have no real logic to it. Actually, it's based on a very complicated system of correction factors to give you a response that you want. So this thing will respond to the broadband television signals the same way like you're trying to get a group of cells to respond to a, um, to a broadband spectrum. In other words, you want a whole bunch of frequencies or wavelengths to be able to be picked up by this thing because normally an antenna, simple antenna, responds only to one frequency that's determined by the standing wave energy that's produced on that antenna. Okay, it was found in around the 50s into the 60s that the need developed for extremely wide bandwidth or wide frequency response antennas to deal with these new radar pulses that had spectra that went way out, way into the microwave range and covered you know, many octaves of frequency. So what they did is they took this and rather than going through all this effort of correction factors, uh, which, which really didn't work anyway, is they found that you just put these in simple logarithmic proportion and for some reason, which couldn't really be explained, the antenna would just respond evenly to all frequencies. And what was interesting is a virtual antenna appeared out about maybe one and a half times farther. So the antenna was synthesizing an antenna in the space beyond it. So we've taken these theories, the theory of the organic patterning of, of life, which is based on these log periodic ratios, and applied it to antenna theory, which is logarithmic in form, and made a log periodic antenna based on the Lukowski multi-wave oscillator antenna and based on the golden ratio. So what happens here, when you have a situation where you have a number of frequencies, it produces what's called a, um, an envelope or what you might say a composite waveform. Now we know if we take all of our odd frequencies, it produces a waveform like this of abrupt transitions. This the frequency spectrum of this being a fundamental of, of the first frequency. 
and then a third harmonic operating at triple frequency, fifth harmonic operating at five times the frequency, seventh harmonic seven times the frequency, and so on down the line. And the composites of all of these angular actions all combine to produce this transient. Now, if you change the phase of these around, then instead you get pulses of energy. Okay, when you take and add up all of these things, when they're not just in simple relation like this, but in logarithmic relation, you get what are called impulses. And these waves have specific shapes that look like this, which Reich called organomes. So basically, you're producing shapes in time you take your power envelope that look actually like living organisms. And that's one of the things we're attempting to do here is produce electrical waveforms that actually have the shapes of life, but now not only in the dimension of space, but in the dimension of time. So we're producing a type of electrical waveform that's completely organic in its nature. Now what I found in my experiments with, with pulsed radio frequency Tesla coils, not using spark gaps, but using you know, pulsed alternators or vacuum tube amplifiers is that patterns grow around these that are completely organic in form. Okay, in this case, this was a block of wood brought near the apparatus and of course it starts to break down because of the dielectric flux intensity. It just, you know, will produce little sparks and carbonizations. So we brought this near the tip of the transformer and let the discharge start burning the wood it starts off by making just a regular fire in the bottom of the wood and then all of a sudden it starts emitting a lot of various colors and then you get two feelers that look just like the the little ideals on a um, a mollusk like a slug or a snail and these of course have a golden ratio angle between them and these feelers start out and they burn little paths in the wood and then they'll get so far to like a predetermined distance, almost like the space itself has intelligence, and then it'll split in the pairs of feelers. This process keeps on going on until after a couple of minutes, this aggregate space waveform appears that, if you take measurements on it, is, it seems to be purely organic in form. Okay, if you use the atmosphere, which of course is a more homogeneous medium than a block of wood, which has imperfections in it, then you get actual spatial log periodic formations. It's kind of hard because it's three-dimensional that twist around up on the top of the, of the uh, space above the coil like caduceus coils. And what's, very, what's particularly interesting is not only does space seem to have this innate organic geometry to it that the electricity just fills in and makes living patterns, you have to do this pulsed. It won't happen continuously. You can't have one stand. It's something that only can exist with pulses or transient waveforms. As you get a burst, you have one of these patterns stand in your mind, of course, you know, you can remember the geometric position in space. The next one, which occurs several fractions of a second later, is in another position. And then you notice that the next one occurs in another position. After you watch this, you find that every other discharge is rotating in one particular direction and every discharge in between is rotating in the opposite direction. So you produce a rather interesting space waveform where you have two spirals going in opposite directions depending upon whether it's odd or even cycle in time. In other words, one, three, five, seven, and so on. Starting from the first count, the first pulse will be rotating in one direction and vice versa, two, four, six, eight, will be rotating in the opposite direction. Okay, to carry this one step further, what we've done is superimposed fluxes from Tesla transformers in bulbs filled with gaseous media. Okay. And when you do this, you find that you actually start to get galactic formations and what appears to be outlines of marine organisms, all with the most stunning color. And this connects directly to Reich's cosmic superimposition theory, where if you take two primary energy fluxes and converge them in a space, these longitudinal, not scalar, but longitudinal fluxes will start to form a spiral formation which grabs up the energy and these spirals are all again based on log periodic form. A couple of times I had the good fortune to actually see what looks like photographs of deep space appear in these bulbs. 
you actually got to get your galaxies and nebula, and it's something you have to kind of pinch yourself to see if you're awake or if it's really happening. And some kind of, I found some kind of ether pressure usually appears inside the bulb, and the bulb explodes, such as what it characterizes like 100 pounds per square inch. So not only is it producing form, but even matter itself appears to be synthesized out of this process. Okay. Since this is coming around again, <laughs> I thought those of you who are sort of new to the field might like just a very brief thumbnail history. About a quarter of a century ago, I was the judge, jury, and executioner on every new age device that came through Southern California. That included free energy motors, healing devices, you name it. And in the course of a good year, we had examined maybe 100, 125 devices, and about 99.9% .9 of them were either placebo, garbage, or wishful thinking, hallucination. But once in a long while, we would come across something that was exceptional. And in 1962, it was the Lukowski multiple wave oscillator. Now, I am going to say I reserve the right to change my mind about anything I'm telling you. <laughs> And number two, we wish we'd had someone like Eric Dollard around at the time we were playing with this. But what we did is we built a very small device, small being the size of an attaché case, that had the Lukowski antennas driven by a Tesla coil. The first thing I did was call up all of my sick friends, lined them up, and did experiments on them. Couldn't do that today because of FDA. We cured uh, Tommy Harrod's father, who was about to have an amputated leg, diabetic edema. He was out uh, within about a week. He'd gotten a driver's license legally, was walking again. We cured any number of cancer patients, believe it or not. We uh, found that uh, many of these had wound up in the hands of veterinarians. We published the schematics. And the veterinarians were curing cancer in animals that uh, other vets would put to sleep. So word would get around, and the veterinarians would bring sick animals to the guy that had it, and uh, they got well. Well, at the time, what we assumed was that we were simply shock exciting a number of dipoles. Think of some big brandy glasses. Bong, 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 bong. And when you uh, drove these with enough of a spark so that the spark would drive all of these concentrically down to the center. Each of these would emit a particular frequency depending on the physical size of the dipole. The heterodynes of these, the sums and differences of all of these put together would put out sort of an RF white noise. Well, when we finally looked at the spectrum of this on a huge Hewlett-Packard gigahertz spectrum analyzer, we found a lot of unexpected uh, harmonics way up in the giga, giga, gigahertz range that we later found were caused by the arc itself. Let's say that the end of this screwdriver is uh, showing these sparks that you could draw off the secondary of a Tesla coil. Obviously, when this was at zero, there was nothing here. But if we looked at it with a very high-speed camera, and the spark would go out to about four and a half inches and then collapse, of course, your eye can't see this because of persistence of vision, what we had was an antenna of zero dimensions at this point, uh, micro-millimeter dimensions until it got out to about four and a half inches and then collapsed. So part of this energy was coming from this ionized air. You know, when the air uh, is ionized, you have practically a dead short between here and here. Any of you who pulled a spark uh, on a pair of pliers from a system, okay, I'm making too much noise with this, would realize that a tremendous amount of energy can be handled by this ionized or short-circuited path of air. So what we had not taken into account in the original thinking about this device was that we had, besides the rather broad spectra of each of these dipoles, which is shock excited, 
we had another frequency modulated signal on top of this. At the time, we had simply assumed that since you were in this direction to the antenna, you were absorbing an H vector. We knew that the E vector, which radiates from the ends because of skin effect, would not penetrate a biosystem. It would run around the surface, which is why you can uh, stand in the field of a Tesla coil and light a light bulb in your hand and not be electrocuted. So this was long before the term scalar, longitudinal, soliton, uh, buzzwords were floating around. I'm not too sure that anybody thoroughly understands what these mean in the actual universe. But we were getting really stunning results. The animals would respond to this much more rapidly than the human beings. My vice president many years ago in Bechtech was the astronaut Gordon Cooper. We loaned it to him. He had a 15-year-old police dog that had been part of the family forever dog was dragging itself around. Its hind legs weren't working. After two days, the dog was up, frisking around, running around the swimming pool. So Gordon would take this box wherever he went, to Washington, Houston, NASA. He was getting people out of wheelchairs. <laughs> but we're not supposed to talk about this. And it took a long time to get that thing back from him a few years ago when we went our separate ways. Now, that was an actuality. Why it works, we don't know. What is electricity? I have graduate degrees, I don't know. But in a year, this was one of the most exciting things that had come along. Now, I'm delighted to say that Eric knows a lot more about what's going on here than I did. And I'm just so happy that as part of this conference, we're getting the people together who can bring more light on some of these ancient mysteries, and we'll probably see the fallout much more rapidly than if this synergism were not allowed to take place. So uh, that was my, uh, that was our big thing a quarter of a century ago in 1962. The MWO is coming around in interest and I'm sure their device will be far better than anything we did then. Yes, Tom? Uh, what do you think of uh, uh, Once more? Uh, absolutely no comment. A number of devices were built. Oh, the Bruce Copen is absolute garbage. It's a symbolic device, just as a hand-drawn Hieronymus machine was. There's a little light in the center that flashes. We felt at the time that unless you could read a newspaper about 10 feet away in a totally dark room by the brush discharge and current discharge, it wasn't putting out enough current to penetrate to where the cells actually were. But if we take the scalar model, maybe a lot less power would work. Uh, yes? Uh, there's an explanation that uh, the Copen instrument was producing the frequencies in a cyclotronic field and thereby penetrating into the body cyclotronically and getting the same effect but at lower levels of intensity. I've heard many of these claims, and I believe it is terribly difficult to separate placebo from actuality, particularly when it's all in the mind. But uh, my bent, my prejudice is that I have a whole lot more confidence in devices that we can measure and that do something to animals, not just the psyche. Okay, any other questions? Let's I have turn to the question. There's one point you brought up in some of the talks that we've had back in California about how some of the people um, who were cured with these devices, where the cancer was driven out of their body, people would have an accident or commit suicide. All right, we have another terrible thing to tell you. <clears throat> At the time that we came up with this and some other devices, we honestly believed, I was naive enough to believe, that people who had an incurable disease wanted to get better. How many of you have believed that? <laughs> We found that in several cases where we took this person's crutch away from him, he was more committed to the secondary gains than to getting well. Here would be an aging engineer who had cancer. His wife was uh, being polite to him again. The children were bringing chicken soup. When he got well, he had to go back and compete with the younger engineers. He would commit suicide within a couple of years. And of course, Dick Simonton found this, and the fact that many people were more attached to the secondary gains, the pity, the sympathy, 
the fact that cancer, for example, is a socially acceptable way to leave the planet and you'll still get the admiration and sympathy of your friends, actually it's up to us. So a number of people who had totally clean biopsies, much to the amazement of the group at UCLA Medical with whom we were working, I won't mention his name, it will embarrass him, but the greatest cancer expert, quote, west of the Mississippi, sent us some patients. Oh, for example, one girl, uh, I won't mention her name, called up one day, Bob, my stomach is terribly sore after we'd cured her. She was sent home to die. She had lumps all over her body and had chemotherapy, and I had to literally lift her and carry her and set her in the machine. When she was well, she went back to the cancer clinic at UCA, UCLA Biomed Los Angeles, and all of the interns were called in to palpate, where did those masses go? What happened to those tumors? And that was why her stomach was sore. Nobody could believe that this inoperable, terminally ill woman had been turned around in four weeks. But what you must know <clears throat> is that if you do plan on, quote, healing somebody legally or illegally, you must deal with the psyche, the mind, the high self to get that person's permission to stick around this plain planet of painful endeavor for another indefinite sentence. Because God gave us free will. If we opt out, there are a number of socially acceptable ways to do this. And to heal a person without his will is to interfere with his free agency. And I think of all the things, the shocks that have come to me, the greatest is that many people who are ill are using that as a defense mechanism, etc. So don't just go out there and do this stuff. Look at the entire equation. And uh, thanks for bringing that up. We normally don't open it, but there are a lot, there's a lot more in heaven and earth. <laughs> uh, yes? Well, I've been here. I've also heard things about uh, moving into the death wish people. Uh, do you deal with that too then? Not right now. <laughs> uh, of course, here's the cliche. How many of you believe in faith healing and prayer and that you can make a plant or an animal better? All of us do. Well, if this works, then so does psychic affliction. You cannot have one side of the yin without the yang. There are two surfaces to the coin. It's an actuality, but people in the, quote, new age very, very seldom want to look at that particular aspect of actuality. Yes, it can happen. It has. Uh, yes, and that's the topic of another long dissertation, but I want to turn it back to the experts here. So thank you for the... Thank you, Bob. So he's always good for some great insights. There's a few uh, things I wanted to point out about this antenna here. Um, uh, I just got a letter from Trevor Constable regarding the multi-wave oscillator when we began looking into this, and he told me he regarded the multi-wave oscillator as a false path, that he felt that whatever healing effect was being produced by the apparatus was the uh, uh, healing ethers, or the formative ethers of Steinerian physics, said they were marshalling to suppress the electromagnetic activity, because you know, he says life hates electricity. So that was just one opinion I thought I'd bring in, because I have a high regard for Trevor's work. So, but looking into Trevor's work, if you saw Bob's talk on uh, history of radionics, he showed some of uh, Trevor's cloud busters, which he moves in his vehicles. They're no longer tied into uh, groundwater or anything. And basically, he's dealing with log periodic geometric shapes. And he's uh, scientifically demonstrated that you can manipulate the ethers with these geometric shapes. And that's basically what we're working with with this antenna. And we've submitted a pair of these antennas to Trevor for use in his primary en uh, energy engineering experiments. And we should be publishing results on that also. And as Eric said, with the log periodic antenna, it keeps on putting out a virtual antenna it goes on. So there's actually more rings happening here. That's a basic pattern of life. Life just keeps on going and growing. You know, it's very tenacious. You know, if there's one little bit where life can go, it fills the space. And uh, that's why we feel these antennas will be good. Basically, if I would recommend for any use, it would be to grow sprouts or something like that. You know, like what Bob was talking about with health. You know, most disease is a death wish. And you know, the only way you can get healthy is if you go out there and you eat real food and you keep your body working, you know? It's 
about it. You don't have to go to a doctor to figure that out. You just stay healthy. And uh, but we feel that you know th these will have applications in agriculture, and uh, also we found that they're also good for cleaning vibrations out of the rooms. I took over Borderland Sciences from Riley Crabb. You know, he spent the last 25, 30 years just hanging out seances, and there was incredible astral crap, we'll call it, just embedded deeply into the walls there. And we did uh, a lot of banishing rituals, you know, s smudging things and stuff, and we got a lot of residue out, but it was still there. People come in, get headaches after a week. And once in t we tried for about six months or more, it wasn't until we hung up a pair of these antennas that the room really cleared out, and uh, people really noticed a difference. It made it more vibrant. But basically, we've just got a few minutes left, so I'd like to field questions here. Yes? Can you differentiate between what's going on here and a negative ion generator and also a common or a negative ion generator that would be beneficial? I've used the, the negative ion generator, it's not these. And initially, I feel good, and then over a period of time, my head gets really stuffy and I end up feeling sick. I was wondering, you know, Sure. I was sort of the daddy of the modern generation of negative ion generators. The first ones were made by a West Tech Electric Heater Company in San Francisco that used a hot body as the uh, ion generator. We found about 1957 to 58 that a brush discharge from a point source would generate considerably more cleaner, better ions. The U.S. Radium Corporation brought out a device using a radioactive source in a 700 volt field. The uh, largest selling ionizer in the USA today uh, was 70,000 copies through JSNA, and I owned the design of that, and they never paid me any royalties, so I can speak from a. <laughs> uh, the negative ions, if they're in a balance of about five parts of negative to three to four positive, are highly beneficial. They also have the effect of charging the small particles in the atmosphere with like, L-I-K-E, sign, S-I-G-N. They will then repel, go stick on the wall, stick on the floor, make your walls dirty. Uh, they work for about 30% of the population. The possible side effects are the generation of ozone, O3, which will oxidize lung tissue and is fairly toxic in more than six parts per million, or billion. I had something to add to you. Um, we only got about three minutes left here, but since we're talking about the negative ions, I just uh, ran into a person out in California who's done extensive research into ozone and its effects. And we'll be publishing this in an upcoming journal, hopefully the next one if I get the article on time. And he's found there's two types of ozone, what he calls cold plasma ozone and uh, you know, hot spark ozone. And he's found the cold plasma ozone to be very beneficial. You know, he had a dog that got in a fight and his jaw was torn open and all filled with pus. And he treated the dog for three days with his cold ozone generator and uh, it killed all the infections. And, and uh, there are clinics injecting O3 into tumors with good results, uh, aspirating blood with O3, with autotransfusions, with excellent results in AIDS, for example. Kill, uh, many bacteria are anaerobic. Uh, the answer to your question is that the uh, ion machines will change the serotonin level of the brain. This has been established in many clinical tests. You can overdo it. You'll get leg cramps, you'll get all sorts of things if you're too close to one of these for too long a time. So use them uh, rather sparingly. If you're one of the 30% of the gross population who's sensitive to this, they're a godsend. If you have allergies, even if the ions don't work on you personally, the electrostatic charges will knock the solid particulate matter out of the air and you're breathing a cleaner uh, environment. And I see we're just about out of time. Are there any? I, I, yes, sir. Well, maybe Ed Skilling is right. You might be able to do it without the rings because you have an FM antenna putting out energy here down to the giga, giga, gigahertz. Maybe it is scalar where if you shock excite the atmosphere, you have a number of components which are not well explained in the Maxwell equations. Uh, we were purists 
went to concentric ring antennas because we were using the model of the heterodynes creating enough white noise up in the gigahertz range to somehow affect living systems, whether it was simply being picked up by these little hairs, <coughs> which are antenna on your body, or whether they were penetrating below the skin. And We believe so. We believe the pulse repetition rates are part of it. We were hitting it with a sledgehammer, and in there somewhere were the magic numbers. And had we had unlimited funds and time, we would have gone after it. By the way, I've never been funded. I have never charged anyone a nickel for this. People were bringing sick animals into my, ringing my doorbell at midnight, and they would have this little kitten that would have to be put to sleep, and I'd get out of bed and treat it, and they'd sometimes write, the cat's okay now. So it was a real headache. <laughs> and I suggest go thy way and tell no man is still good advice. <laughs> we have a lot more to say, but there's only a minute left. What we're going to be carrying now, all our current research is in the Journal of Borderland Research. We're going to keep current on this, and if we're wrong, we'll correct ourselves as we go, and we're open to any and all input on this. And just one final thing I want to say, Peter Kelly brought a scalar field detector by, and he could brought by one way, could measure it. He turned the instrument sideways, and he could actually pick up a field coming off of this. So that was an interesting experiment we just did a little over an hour ago. So thank you, and we're always around if anybody has any questions later.